Just a couple of words about the program. As I said, it was established in 2015 as a way to offer UL students and alumni the opportunity to apply to a fully funded residency to explore concerns that define the 21st century, like biodiversity, environmental sustainability, social economy, and human rights. We started with two partners that year, and we now have an incredible network of international hosts from Brazil to India, from Senegal to Canada, and across Europe and the UK. I thought that um, in a moment in which physical residencies are limited or suspended due to the restrictions for the global pandemic of COVID-19, it would be a good opportunity to invite our, some of our partners and residents to come together to reflect on their experiences and on their creative role in envisioning uh, a world of tomorrow. Rachel is an artist exploring a shared methodology between drawing and mining. She has exhibited her work internationally and realized several public art commissions in the Netherlands and in New York City. Recent exhibitions and projects include How the Land Lies, a Science Art Center, in Ireland 2020, the Drawing Research Forum Autumn 2019 at the Drawing Room in London, um, Unfolding Landscapes at the Cacao Fabric Helmond 2018, and in 2017, the Independent Residency at BAM Centre for the Arts. Rachel received her BFA from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and MA Drawing from the University of the Arts London. And finally, Lucy Orta is a visual arts practitioner addressing key social and ecological challenges through making and collaborative working, employing a wide range of media to visualize relationships between the body and our natural and urban habitats. Lucy has been a professor at London College of Fashion since 2002. She is a member of the Center for Sustainable Fashion and as chair of art and the environment um, as we said she founded the art for the environment international residency program those of us that are continuing our oral history are blessed what we shared god was told from way back we were part of the ecosystem. We were not masters of it. You know, after we grow up from our biological mothers, the earth becomes our caregiver. Everything that we need is there. Well, we were raised to believe that everything has a spirit, and that everything around us is alive and has a purpose. The spirit of the land and our spirit. You can't separate land and people. In Treaty 7 territory, I'm accepted. I'm something. And I'm with my people. We honor our ancestors by acknowledging Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the Treaty 7 nations, the Pekani First Nation. The Sixaga First, First Nation, the Ghana First, First Nation, Stony, Stony Nakoda, Nakoda First, First Nations, and the Sutina First, First Nation. We acknowledge the ancestral territory of the Sixaga, the, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Confederacy, and the home of Métis Region, region Number Three. Um, <clears throat> thanks so much, um, Brandy. It was really wonderful to see those images of BAMF again. It made me really um, miss being there. Um, I'm going to um, um, <clears throat> share uh, some of the work that I made at BAMF with you today. Um, but I'd also like to show you what happened after BAMF. 
um, because it was an incredibly, it had an incredible impact on my practice. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about this, this initiative of the AR um, program is that it can really sort of trigger something which has this, this really powerful effect um, going forward. And um, it started sort of for me anyway, um, at the residency at Banff. Um, this is an image of my, I hope you can all see this. I, I'm um, assuming everyone can, can see. Okay, great. Um, this, is, this is my studio at Banff and I think I probably had the, one of the most beautiful um, spots. You look, it looks out, I look out over, I looked out over uh, Sulphur Mountain and when I got there, the leaves were sort of just turning and when, when I left in October, um, it was already, everything was covered with snow. Um, and there were two main things which I think um, really had a big impact on my practice. Uh, and the first was really the landscape itself um, and walking in the mountains and really being um, sort of overwhelmed and, and amazed by the, by the beauty of the, of the landscape. Um, and then the other uh, really important thing was the connections that I made there. Um, which I'll say something about in a in a minute because that's that was something that's that's been incredibly important moving forward. Um, here's an image of um, the mountains in uh, along something called the Ice Line Trail, which is in Yoho National Park, um, which is probably I don't know a few hours north of Banff, um, where we went on a hike at one point with a few of the artists, and the the experience of walking in the mountains for me was was really uh, uh, I don't know. I, I I would say sort of sublime in a way. It it there was you could see the age, this ancient um, layering and sedimentation that had taken place to build the mountains, and yet as you walked along the edge of the of the path, for instance, these little pebbles would be would be falling down the side of the mountain. So. It was really as if time was sort of this ancient time and this present time were kind of compressed in one. Um, and um, at the same time I was at Banff, uh, there was also a, a wonderful program called Geologic Time that was taking place. Um, so we were able to follow some lectures on the geology of the region and um, uh, I also visited a coal mine, uh, sort of abandoned coal mine in the area with the, with that group. So it was it was a very um, it, it really added a lot to the experience of being there to have this other program going on at the same time. Um, and this is a work that I made while I was at Banff. Um, the the influence of the mountains is is sort of implicit in it. It's all it's, again this 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 feeling of something collapsing and being built up at the same time. Um, so the the work is on the floor and on the wall, um, and you can't really see it in this work. But the work is made with the mechanical pencil, so it's made with an incredible amount of detail. And while I was there, I, I had the sense of I was I was very aware of time, as I said, and I was very aware also of of the need to slow time down, to slow things down. Um, so, and one of the other things, as I mentioned, that happened while I was at Banff was that um, I uh, started together. Well, I didn't start. I was invited to become a part of a of a working group um, with two other artists who were there at the same time, Mika Bandini and Meredith Davenport, and we um, decided to form a small working group to discuss our, um, our own work and to work on ecological issues and, and social issues within our work. So we, uh, we're still actually meeting. We've, we've met probably every month for the last two or three years, which is, um, uh, and it's been an incredibly fruitful um, uh, connection. So that was one of the most important things I think that happened at Banff uh, for me. Um, and I think uh, well, one of the things that we also have done in our group has been to read together. And we started reading um, Timothy Morton, um, his book called Hyper Objects. And I think that was a very important um, um, book for me. Um, a hyper object, according to Morton, is something sort of akin to global warming or pollution. It's something that's, that's so large in, in scale that it's impossible to grasp. And, but it's also something that comes very close to you. So if you think about global warming, um, it's, it's going to take place over this, 
well, quite a quite. It's it's not going away. It's going to be with us, with people for the for the foreseeable future. Um, but it, it's also can be very very um, close in the form of sunburn, for instance, um, or or in the form of flooding, or in the form in some other form that really um, reaches you very closely. And this is a very disorienting um, uh, condition. So um, it disrupts this notion of human beings as being in charge of the world and, and having a place within uh, nature, kind of capital N nature. Um, so we, we're we getting to the point where we have to realize that we're no longer in charge of things. And according to Morton, that's, that's um, art. He sees art as something that can um, walk us through this difficult time and, and accustom us uh, accustom us to this um, to this new new state, which is actually an emotional state. And so this work, um, which I made after I left BAMP, was was sort of reflecting that understanding of um, humans and non-humans being part of the same body and being in a state of collapse and and sort of also standing up at the same time, but also with the kind of emotional impact that's very hard to express rationally or um, in words. Um, and one of the other things that, that uh, Mika and Meredith and I uh, have been discussing a lot in our group was um, really how to kind of react visibly and, and legibly to the, um, the issues that we're interested in in terms of ecology and, and not just as a sort of formal reflection or an abstraction, but really to, to bring more narrative elements and more visual elements into the work that really reflect um, the, 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 the really pressing concerns um, of, of the, that have to do with the ecological crisis. Um, so in 2018, I took part in a research group um, at the Royal Academy of Art where I teach drawing in The Hague. And I started to explore the relationship between mining and drawing. And um, as it's, it was nice to see the, ex, the, the last exhibition um, that, that Brandy showed, because I think excavation, um, questions about excavation are, are central in thinking about ecology and, and the impact of, um, of global warming, because everything is sort of triggered by um, the fossil fuel use, of course, or, or that's that's where so much of the problem sort of starts. So I was thinking about mark making um, in terms of, or I was thinking about excavation in terms of mark making on the earth and mark making on the drawing and these different ways of touching um, the material of the paper, for instance, or the material of the earth and how I might, um, how this might somehow reflect um, how to work with ecological issues within my practice. So this is an image of um, a small exhibition with a table with sort of small sketches. And then you see some photographs of a very large lignite, uh, a brown coal mine in Germany that I started to visit. Um, so, um, and this work is um, another sort of example of how I've been thinking about how to, um, develop a visual language that relates drawing and mining together. Um, this work is called the other ore body. And an ore body is the term um, for the mass of ore that's suitable for mining. And I started um, to think about sort of the cross sections and how the body and the earth, um, our bodies, or human bodies, and the body of the earth resemble each other, uh, that kind of comes back around to Timothy Morton's um, work for objects because as he's he's discussing this this disruption in our understanding of how we of our place in the world um, and, and not being in control of things anymore one of the consequences of that according to Morton is that we become very intimate with the things around us with the other entities around us and I think this intimacy with materials especially for artists is an incredibly powerful um, um, sort of tool or, or way to to talk about or to to envision um, how we might shift our our mentality. Um, here's a, a sort of detail of that work because um, it can show you that it's it's I'm really looking at sort of veins and and um, 
yeah, the, the wrinkles, um, but also erosion, or, or it, it also resembles a lot of the stones that you might see, for instance, up in the mountains, or that kind of, that kind of imagery that's, that's kind of um, shifting back and forth between human and, and landscape or earth. Um, so my last, or one of my last uh, images that I'd like to share with you is the next project, which is actually a site visit to um, uh, Russia to visit a diamond mine in Siberia. Um, I was invited after the last research project to take part in this project, uh, which was called What Do Landscapes Say? And we were working with a group of Dutch artists and Russian um, artists and architects um, to investigate landscapes in Russia. Um, that trip has been postponed because of COVID, but hopefully uh, it will take place in the fall this year. Um, and this is a, a, a really, I mean, if you compare this to the first image of the mountains, it's almost like an inverted mountain. It's a huge hole in, in the earth. It's one of the largest man-made holes in the world um, in Siberia. Um, and um, I'll be hopefully visiting there to um, collect material and um, do some more research um, on the site. Um, and I, I think, I mean, for me, it's very clear the connection. I, I, I hope that's be, sort of become visible as well as I've talked, but this connection that started in BAMP to, to this site. Um, and I'll just show you the last image, um, which is of a, another drawing that I started um, at the beginning of the lockdown in, I guess, last April in the Netherlands, um, that I'm, I'm now also very much thinking about the sort of bodily impact of, of an artwork um, to create a sense of identification with the material and also a vulnerability with, with um, of one's own body and the material, because I, I really do think that that's the um, starting point for a shift in attitude is to realize we are part of the earth uh, and not separate from the earth. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's what I wanted to show you. I'm, I'm currently doing um, a master's artistic research at the um, art school uh, St. Lucas in Antwerp. And so the, the project um, on Siberia and with these drawings and the drawing vocabulary, um, are what I'm really currently working on. But I, I um, yeah, I'd like to give an enormous thanks to um, the Lucy, Camilla, Brandy, and the whole UAL program because it's been, um, it's really had a, a, an incredible impact on my, on my work and life. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll hand over to Lucy now. Thank you, Rachel. It's a really hard act to follow. It's beautiful. Your work is just so powerful. And um, your, yeah, how you've approached the landscape is just very moving. Thank you very much, Camilla, for uh, bringing the series and conversations together. So I'm going to present, um, actually, I'm, I'm actually on my website here, and I've already entered into the Amazonia section. So I don't think I can go back any longer. Uh, Yes. Okay. Yeah, here's the entry point into the website. I wanted to share this with you because um, the work that I do is vast and I, I do this together with my partner, Jorge Otter at Studio Otter. So um, we have diverse, uh, we work with diverse mediums and you can see that here in the images from textiles to porcelain to metalwork to performance to wood to film glass blowing, uh, light, public sculpture. So there's a, a, a vast variety of mediums. And within each of these thumbnails are our meta projects, our major themes. So I've clicked on the window here, water, Amazonia, Antarctica. And Brandy mentioned a little bit earlier the food, water, life. So when we, when we were, had the honor of being um, part of the faculty at BAMP Centre, we were able to um, continue working on this subject area, food, here, water and life with the Antarctica project. But I'm going to enter into the Amazonia section, which is really um, very closely interwoven with our reflections on the environment. I'm going to scroll down here, so I welcome um, those of you that are listening here this evening, you can do exactly the same, enter into the selected artworks and navigate around and, and go into each of the sections. So if I scroll all the way down, um, 
it's organized in chronological order and it starts with um, an expedition that we were lucky enough to go on to the Amazon in 2009 and the results of the exhibition were presented in the Natural History Museum in 2010. I'm not going to jump into uh, these artworks here uh, because I'm going to scroll back up, zoom back up, but I will, do welcome you to uh, click on them and you can see the film of our expedition and our discovery of the Amazonian landscape and collaborating together with the scientists uh, during this expedition and then the results of that uh, on exhibition in the um, Natural History Museum in London later on. I'm actually going to talk about uh, these two works here, so that's Symphony for Absent Wildlife and Disappearance. Now Symphony for Absent Wildlife and disappearance were both completed thanks to um, us being faculty, so that's me and Jorge being faculty members at the BAMP Center. So we were able to, just like Rachel, take a, advantage of the wonderful facilities that BAMP Center offered for artists. And um, as Brandy mentioned, the studios were open 24 hours a day and with wonderful technicians and staff on the website here are some of the pictures of a performance that took place in Calgary. I'll talk a little bit about um, the inception of this project, Symphony Faps and Wildlife. So Studio Auto were invited in 2014 to propose a performance for the Nuit Blanche, which is um, an all-night performance program that's organized in different cities around the world. And I believe this was the second Nuit Blanche to take place in the city of Calgary. Calgary is a couple of hours drive from the BAMP Centre, um, has an international airport, uh, it's a large city with a university, or several universities as Brandy mentioned, museums, and so the opportunity to spend time in the city allowed um, me and Jorge to, to, get, uh, to get a better understanding of um, both the city itself but also the region. We were able to journey out into the Banff National Park um, to see the landscape and come back to the city, spend time in the museums. I have a wonderful photographic collection as well as fine art and objects and also meet the faculty from the uh, Alberta College of Art and Design and uh, First, Nation, First Nation elders. So this opportunity of immersing ourselves within the city and the landscape um, as uh, Brandy quite rightly said, um, acknowledges the spirits that we felt uh, actually being in the landscape, being in the city. And the project, the symphony, um, draws from uh, a genius, genius Loki, which is a body of work, which is about the spirits of the place. So by creating these creatures, these characters here, we're referencing the spirits uh, that were once um, abundant on the Abalton Plains. Um, I don't know whether I'll be able to show you the video here, but I would like to share that with you just a little bit later on, the actual completion of this project, which uh, we completed actually six years later in 2020. So the performance took place in Calgary um, all night long, and the performance consisted of an orchestra of masked, spirits. Each of the masks is a species that is either threatened or extinct and the mask species are dressed in the costumes of an orchestra made with felt, woolen felt. And each member of the orchestra, each musician, is holding a tiny little bird whistle in his or her hand. I, I'm not sure whether you can see that as I'm flicking through the images. So here are the, um, a collection of the bird whistles. These are handcrafted bird whistles that I bought from an, an enthusiast in France who crafts them to uh, share the knowledge of uh, bird song with the general public. They're pedagogic tools, but originally they were used for hunting, but he's transformed them into a tool where we can get a better understanding of the sounds of nature. So I bought the collection of these whistles and the orchestra play these for um, I think it was around 20 minutes and the, the, the symphony itself builds up with one musician taking one of the little bird whistles off the stand and beginning to play it so the bird song um, is emitted from the surround speakers in the public space here in Calgary 
and another orchestra member comes and takes a whistle and the sounds build up to create uh, the feeling of a dawn chorus, the assembling of these birds, the creatures in um, an atmosphere of uh, the natural environment. And then after 20 minutes, uh, the building up of this song then uh, closes with a, a, a deafening silence. And um, actually the, the emotion of that was so strong during the Nuit Blanche that we had members of the public in tears. So I think in terms of um, this performative work achieving, in, in a sense, this, this sense of disappearance of uh, the, the, threatened, the threatened fragility of our environment, um, the performance was, uh, went far beyond our, our expectations. So that was in um, 2014. And then um, the project takes many sinuous routes to arrive to a final conclusion. There are several performances taking place in different locations and um, also transform the work into a museum installation. I'm not sure, can you see these images? I flicked around now, so I'm, I'm not sure whether they're showing the Symphony for Absent Wildlife in um, the Attenborough Art Gallery in uh, Leicester. Yeah, uh, we can see the images, Lucy. And oh, great. Yeah. Not, not like five minutes left. Okay, so I'll take you to the final conclusion. So. As I mentioned, in 2014, the performance took place in Calgary, but it wasn't in 2020 that I was able to conclude the work. And um, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen here and uh, just take you to the video where you can see the results of this very long process of performance and uh, interaction with uh, the musicians and the different environments. Um, I won't carry on playing the film at last 80 minutes and we obviously don't have time for that this evening, but it was a, a sneak preview of the landscapes and you can see um, this is the Banff Centre, the National Park, and the interaction of these spirits within the landscape, so bringing back the spirits into their rightful place. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Um really powerful and um, emotional work. Uh, thank you so much. It was very fascinating to see from Bo's presentation, to hear from, from Brandy first, to know more about the history of the place and to understand better um, where Banff is, um, is located. Uh, and then to see so clearly the impact uh, that BAMF had on your on, on both works. Um, so in fact, um, even without uh, being necessarily prepared, I think the encounter with such a um, powerful uh, location and powerful history um, had a, um, a huge impact and, and the legacy. And so the fact that um, also Rachel, you are still in contact um, so it wasn't only an encounter with the, with the place, but also with people. Um, so going back to the connections that you made and the collaborations um, that is still, um, is still very much alive <laughs> now. Yes, I think that's 
uh, something that you've, you've touched upon, Camilla, is the social aspect of being at the BAMP Centre too. It's about creating artwork, but it's also about interacting with the other members of the residency programmes and having these opportunities to take part in the talks and mix with other artists from other disciplines like musicians and performing arts, but also mathematicians and scientists that are there at the same time. And the, uh, the architecture and the landscape allow that to happen. Um, so it is a very special, wonderful place to, to be. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I have this a working, like a, a really rich uh, relationship now with two other artists who I met at BAMP. Um, but there, there are other people who I haven't mentioned who I've also kept in touch with. Um, um, and I think especially there were, there were a number of, of hikes that we went on. Um, and there was, I think it's this, this moment of being pulled away from your, your normal environment and being put together in this very special place and it, it forges a bond. And so there's a couple of artists from the Netherlands I'm still in touch with, somebody um, in Denmark, um, Veronica Geiger, who I'm still in touch with. So it, it really, it really, um, and that doesn't always happen with residencies. Sometimes you go and you leave, but for some reason, BAM, uh, I think the, 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 the type of people who want to go there, maybe, um, you're, you're, there's not a lot going on besides the center. So you're really focused on the work and the landscape. And that's, that's I think, something that also um, works towards this bond with, with the other artists. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Lorraine. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and she says, it was such great presentations, thank you. I have a question, did you have scientist talks that were working inside the National Park during your residencies? Um, we had a wonderful lecture from, um, and I'm sorry, Randy, I, I didn't look up his name because we talked about it, a very well-known and well-respected um, geologist of the Canadian Rockies. Um, and he gave a lecture which, was was really uh, inspirational because he sort of just I mean when you when you have some information about the geology when you're out in the mountains you you really can see you, you look at things differently with the information that you have I think that's that's the wonderful thing about um, having a connection with with scientists because artists look at the landscape in a particular way but so do scientists and they see different things and you can see the age of the of the mountains if you know what to look for. So we had a number of those kind of conversations, which were I think were really important. The, the, these kinds of um, experiences are much more long term. So um, I mean, let's hope that COVID is is a is a relatively short a pandemic in terms. I know it's um, it's almost a year long now, but. Um, in fact, our, our practices are, are thinking beyond the pandemic, and, and I'm sure uh, you as well, Rachel, that um, it's a kind of interstice, and we shouldn't let it uh, be too negative on, on what we're doing and how we're thinking and plan ahead for the future, and particularly in terms of you know, the climate emergency and what we can be doing for that. We had a wonderful lecture from um, a very well-known and well-respected um, geologist of the Canadian Rockies. Um, and he gave a lecture which was, was really uh, inspirational because he sort of, I mean, when you, when you have some information about the geology, when you're out in the mountains, you, you really can see, you, you look at things differently with the information that you have. I think that's, that's the wonderful thing about um, having a connection with, with scientists because artists look at the landscape in a particular way, but so do scientists and they see different things. And you can see the age of the, of the mountains if you know what to look for. So we had a number of those kind of conversations which were, I think were really important. Amazing. Um, Alon, uh, unless Lucy, you wanted to add something? Um, 
No, but I think, Brandy, it depends on the program as well, doesn't it? Because there can be a more scientific onus on a particular program at a particular period in time. So it really depends on the seams of how that's organized throughout the year. And so if you have a specific interest in, in collaborating with scientists, there may be a program that has that, uh, that, that brings those relationships together. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that a lot. It's, it's, it's this, there's a, a sort of stillness that's taken place because a lot of activities just aren't possible. So all of the sort of extra things have, have disappeared. So there's this incredible kind of focus now to, to research and read and think. Um, but I, I actually, my feeling is that the COVID crisis is, is a harbinger of, of disruptions that will continue to come in the future. So I'm also seeing this as, as a, I, I won't say as a dry run, but as a, as a sort of getting ready for disruption and thinking about how can our practices become more flexible. So I think it's also going to create a, a really strong connection with local spaces because you can't go, I mean, I'm planning to go to Siberia, but I can't go there. So what am I going to do? So I'm shift, So things are shifting to, in, in a way that they're becoming much more intimate and I think that's that's this idea of Timothy Morton's again that we're we're being confronted with things as as they are. Uh, we can't escape, so um, or we can't move away. We can't distract ourselves. So I think I think it's a very interesting and important time actually. Yeah, it's like we're building resilience now. It's really important that we use this period for that. Yeah, yeah, and and I would say that also especially social connections are are the kind of core of what make us resilient so um so in a way we have all the i mean i'm i'm it's so wonderful to have these connections online but we also have connections close to home so it's both of those worlds together that's that support us thank you um there's a, there's another question which uh, will be the last question we can take from marie louise who says beautiful work, thank you. Um, I would like to ask both Lucy and Rachel if the work you eventually produced at the site diverted far from what you had imagined thought it would become before arriving. And I would extend the question to Brandy as well. Um, uh, from, the, from her perspective, um, whether she would expect an artist to go on residency with a really well thought idea about the project. Um, that would be developed uh, at BAM for how much you would embrace um, an open-ended uh, proposal? Yeah, I think uh, I came, I, I, the, one of the first drawings I showed you was this very small work with very, very detailed drawing. And then at the end, I, I ended up making a really large scale, sort of on the wall and floor, sort of falling drawing. Uh, so it is absolutely that the scale had an impact on the work, um, the sense of scale. Um, so, uh, and I, I've carried that forward as well. So yeah, it, things did change quite a lot, but um, they changed not necessarily in the idea, but in the in the expression. I mean, we were very fortunate to go back to BAMP. I think it was three or four times, wasn't it, Brandy? So the first time we were overwhelmed by the facilities and, um, but. Uh, understanding what was available allowed us then to be much more flexible on site and test out new mediums and that was really exciting because we were able to develop works that we hadn't planned to through the interaction with the technicians and the staff um, who were also very professional and competent and very helpful in in helping realize the ideas so that was wonderful is uh, the experimentation that the, the BAMP Centre allowed to go outside mediums that we would traditionally use thank you um thank you very much i think uh we can wrap it up <laughs> uh, so hopefully i'll see you all next week i hope you enjoyed thank you so much thank you very much yeah thanks so much yeah thank you, thank you.